Hello, and again, uh, thank you so much uh, for tuning in tonight. And this is actually the last night of the mission, and so I want to say a double thank you for sticking with us throughout. All Johnny and I have been seeking to do in these nights is to simply explain from the Bible how a person can come to know their sins forgiven and be assured of a home in heaven. And we really hope that this leads you to think about the bigger questions of life and to come to know Jesus personally. Listen, if we can help you in any way, please get in touch with us. Our phone numbers and emails are on the website, so please do. We've been thinking in our studies about life, about eternal life, that being born into God's family, having an assurance of a home in heaven. We've been thinking of satisfying life, that living water that Jesus can give us to fulfill us in our life. We've thought about where do we find life? We go to Jesus, go to the source of life. Then we thought about light and how Jesus can show us meaning in life. He can light up the world and he can give us eyes to see him. But the last night we thought about that great resurrection life that every person who is a Christian will be assured of. Tonight though we're going to have to think about the opposite of life, death, or what the Bible calls the second death. Now I'll say firstly that this is a topic that doesn't sit well with me. I struggle with this because it's so severe. I'm not saying it's not right. I believe it is, but it's dreadful. The reason that Johnny and I wanted to do this mission was not to judge or to look down on people or holier than thou anyone, but it was to warn people. If you're walking down a street and you saw a bus heading to knock someone down, you would very quickly scream at them and shout at them because they were in danger. There are people listening to this tonight, maybe you're listening to this tonight and you are in danger. Not from a bus, but from the second death. We care about you and we want to warn you. It would be fair to say as well that our society don't, doesn't really like this well or doesn't sit well with our society either. We're pretty comfortable with the idea of a God of love though. We like this idea. A God who will overlook our failures and see past our fallings uh, because he loves us so much that he'll let us off. Now, the difficulty is this, is that to love doesn't always mean that you overlook everything. It doesn't mean that you never ask for justice or it doesn't mean that you're never angry. What I mean is I was on a plane a while ago and I was reading the newspaper and to be honest with you, I was trying to distract myself from looking out the window and realizing that I was 33,000 feet in the air. But I came across the most horrendous article about this gang in Manchester, about 30 or so men, who hung around outside this secondary school and the seduced young girls intoxicated them and did unspeakable things to them. As I read that, my blood started to boil. And like, does yours not? And we get angry. Why? Well, because we care. We naturally want justice. We want those monsters to be punished for their crimes against those innocent girls. And we would be right in that. It is most certainly true that God is love. But what about the injustice of the world that God sees and feels against himself? Like, do you think that he doesn't get angry? He does, and it's right that he does, but he does because he is love. Like, do you see that tonight? I just want to say this tonight, just before we get cracking, really. I get that you may have many questions and resentments about this kind of teaching tonight. And for time's sake, I can't go near them. But I'm going to make an appeal to you. Listen to your intuition. Don't ignore it. What I mean is that there are certain things that we know by intuition. For example, we know that there's a right and there's a wrong. And it's more than just good advice. It's actually an imperative. It's a command. It's a must. And so we know without having to look up the law books that what those men did to those girls was wrong. Like, don't we? It's not just the case that, well, I personally think that they were wrong. It's just my opinion. Or in a different culture, and in a different circumstance, that kind of thing might be permissible. No, it's wrong. And we know this intuitively. We also know that it's right to tell the truth, things like to love, to love our neighbour, excuse me. 
We know uh, it's right to save life where possible. It's not a noble thing to run away as a coward. It's not a noble thing to be branded as a liar. Like there's things that we know automatically. We have a keen sense of justice, of right and of wrong. But we also know by instinct that we will outlive this world. Something in us tells us this. So when people talk, for example, about someone who dies, we use the expressions they've passed on, where to? Or they're in a better place, where are they? Or they're at rest. Like We know instinctively that there's another world or something. And the Bible tells us that these intuitions are put there by God. And this is why I say don't ignore them. Like Romans 2 will tell us that they're written on our hearts. The law is written on our hearts. In Ecclesiastes, that eternity is written on our hearts. And my point is that you might disagree with me and throw out all of this stuff in your head, but your heart may not be so easily persuaded. God wants you to know what is true. And he has given you intuition. We believe in justice. We want to see people who are guilty punished for their crime. It's true. But this is given because we are made in the image of God. And it should make us think about that higher level of judgment. About that day whenever God will bring to justice this universe. But we don't like to think about that. Because it might mean that we ourselves will be punished on a cosmic level for the crimes that we have committed against God. But we must think about it. Tonight I'm going to read a passage from Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to think about that great day of judgment. We're going to think about it actually on three levels. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 and 12 says this. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and the books were opened. And another book was opened which is the book of life. Like notice firstly what John sees. He sees a great white throne. And this is significant because it raises for us the question of why this world will be judged. Like let's think about the details here. Firstly, he saw a throne. Now there is a throne behind this universe. This is John's point. This is what he's telling us. And this is what we need to see firstly. Like so often we can go through life thinking that we are in control of our own destiny, that we are independent and that we are autonomous and self-existent, but we are not. There's a throne, someone behind and over this universe. Listen, God has created this world and we are his creatures. He is over us, he rules us and he has the authority to judge us. We are his creations and are accountable to him. Like, can you see that tonight? He has the right over us. And this is what Paul makes clear in Romans 1. He says this. He says that we know by intuition that there's a creator. And because of that, we are without excuse. Now, do you hear that? Like, you will never be able to arrive before the throne in that day and say, well, I didn't know that you were here, God. You do know. You know that there is a God by instinct and you are accountable for that. Listen, you will meet your maker. That's what he's saying. We all know that there's a creator. We know that there's a throne behind this universe. And we know that if we're not right with him, that we will meet this God on that throne. Can you see that this is inevitable? It's inescapable. And so you must prepare to meet your God. There's a throne there's a God behind this universe. That's my point. And he has the right to judge us. But notice secondly that it is a white throne. And this tells us of the character of that throne and the one who sits on it. Why will this judgment take place? Well, because God is holy. In the Bible, there are not many things repeated three times in a row, but this is one of them. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, we're told. He's holy. It means basically that he is different and different in morality. His throne is white, pure, untainted. God is unfathomably good. But we, on the other hand, we've sinned, all of us. And it's not a question of judgment falling on only the bad people. The point is that we're all bad. We're all selfish. We're all self-centered. We have all broken God's moral law. 
and we all stand guilty before the throne. We all stand culpable for the things that we have done. Like, please notice this. It's a white throne. But thirdly, it's a solitary throne. Like, notice what it said about it. That heaven and earth fled away. There was no place found for them. In a sense, this is God saying that he will put down all rule against him. But in terms of this judgment, this is God giving no place for anyone to hide. There'll be nowhere to run because there'll be nothing to hide behind. Everywhere will be emptied of its inhabitants. And so that all the dead, whether that's dead in the sea or in the depths of, of Hades itself, they will all arrive here, great and small. No one will be missing. Like there'll be lawyers there and teachers there. There'll be doctors there and politicians there. There'll be builders there and foremen there. There'll be ministers there and lay people there. There'll be postmen and unemployed there. From all walks of life, from all businesses, all genders, ages, nationalities, cultures, there will be no one missing. All small and great standing before that great white throne. Can you see that this is inevitable, inescapable? That's a reality that we must face and you must face this tonight. Secondly, we'll notice the criteria for judgment. How will God judge this world? Well, verses 12 and 13 say this, And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and hell, or Hades, were give up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done, or according to their works. We're told that there are books and that these books are opened and that the people will be judged according to what they have done, according to their works. Now, I need to firstly say this, that this is not a judgment in the sense of a set of scales or weights to see if our good works will outweigh our bad works and so we will get into heaven. That's not the case here. It's, it's not the trial. No, what we have here is in our law system, the sentencing. And what I mean is people are tried first, they're found guilty, and then they're sentenced. And this here is the great sentencing of our judgment, in that sense, of the peoples of the world. Whether a person will go to the lake of fire or not, we, as we'll see in a minute, has nothing to do with their work. But it's got to be, it's a case of whether their name is written in the book of life. But what this is all about is God's punishment and sentence. And this actually happens in two ways. What I'll call firstly his act of punishment. This will be according to works. Twice it's said. Now you remember that the throne is a white throne. God is just. And I want us to know that he's good, he's pure, and none more so in his judgment. You, you will not be judged for anyone else's sins, but for your own. For the things that you have done wrong against God. And so I want you to see that there are different degrees of judgment. Not, not everyone will suffer the same extent of punishment. So for example, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he said, it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Nineveh than it will be for this generation. Like look at what he's saying. He's talking to Pharisees and they will be judged more severely, more tolerable. There are degrees of punishment fitting the crimes. Why? Well, because the Pharisees had heard Jesus teach and seen his character and seen his miracles and acts of power and they were rejecting him as the Messiah. Like Nineveh never saw anything of that. And they repented. And the Pharisees were more accountable. You will be judged according to your works. And this is what the Bible calls the lake of fire. That great horrendous symbol of wrath and we will you know, people that are not Christians will be plunged into that for all the things that they've done wrong and you might be punished God will actively punish us for our sins like we cannot escape this and listen it's horrendous to think about but it's fair it's right it's just because it's for our work 
actively punished, but secondly, passively punished. Well, what I mean by that is, it's where God steps back from involvement in, in mankind. Like if a person continually says no to God, God will give them their choice and that will be an eternal grant. Like what the Bible calls the second death, eternal, continual separation from God, from anything that is good, pure, kind, loving. All there will be is outer darkness left to yourself and God will allow this because you chose it. Like we misunderstand so much about hell. It is God giving you what you want. There are only two times, kinds of people in the end, says C.S. Lewis. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And to those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. Like you see what Lewis is saying, that God will give you what you want. And if you want to say no to him, he will give you that. This, is, this will be called the second death separation from God because this is what death is Se death is separation from the physical body from the immaterial soul and the second death will be the separation of humanity from God like do you see that this is a reality do you see the how God will judge this world and it's just it's right it's according to our work but thirdly the seriousness of judgment verses 14 and 15 say this then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The lake of fire. And anyone, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I see the seriousness of this. Like the reality of judgment, the criteria of judgment, but the seriousness of judgment. But can you see in this text that there's another book? And God goes looking for it. Like he looks for the names in it. Because if anyone's name is found written in this book, they won't be judged. And God goes looking for it. Like see the mercy and love of God that he doesn't want to judge. Why? Because God is love. Like God is a loving father. Jesus is a loving son. The spirit is a loving spirit. And the Bible teaches that this God has existed as a community and fellowship and relationship for all eternity. A dynamic, active relationship that Lewis used to call the dance. That God, they orbit around each other, love each other. And the reason that God created this world is actually the overflow of that love. So others could be brought into this fellowship. Like God created this universe for us. But whenever Adam rejected this, the Father sent the Son, and the Son Jesus willingly came into this world in the strength of the Spirit to teach and redeem people to Himself and bring them into the dance. How? By loving us and satisfying justice in one movement. God allowed His Son to be taken by soldiers to beat him and mock him and flog him and crown him with thorns and nail him to a tree. But there the Father would actively punish Jesus for the sin of the world. The Bible says that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that means that God punished Jesus in our place. Jesus willingly went out, took our place and was made sin for us. This is the act of wrath of God and Jesus bore it. Like mighty. Jesus cried out, it is finished. And Jesus accomplished the work. He spent God's wrath. He paid the price for us. Like this is how much God loves us. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Like, can you imagine that? I took my daughter one day to Gulliver's play area. And Evie was playing in an area with a couple of other kids. And they were playing with those kind of big building blocks, you know, the big sponge ones. And Evie was hanging around the fringe, but Evie loves to knock things over. And so this is what she went to do. But this older boy saw her, went to stop her, and in his boyish manner, pushed Evie to the ground. Now I tell you, there's something in me stirred as a father, reacted at the thought of someone mistreating my daughter. I just can't get over it. How awful it was for the father to watch men punch 
and kick his son. How awful it was for him to watch those whiplashes and see those nails. But what is just unbelievable is that the father punished him himself. Like, can you imagine that? Can you imagine the pain for God? Like what love, what amazing love he has for us. That Jesus stepped into our place willingly. And what is more is that Jesus went into darkness and in the darkness he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus was at the cross, the Father and the Son experienced the second death, the separation. How awful, how horrendous. Listen to me, God loves you so much. And he's made a way for you. That if you were to realize that you've sinned and yet you deserve to stand before this creator guilty, and you deserve punishment. If you were to see that Jesus died for you, taking your punishment for your sins, if you were to see that he's risen from the dead, to prove that he has finished the work, making a way for all of us to be brought back to God, then if you were to ask God to save you, to repent of your sins, to trust in Jesus, you can know yourself to be saved, you know. And the moment you do, God writes your name in the book of life. Save for all of eternity. But not just to escape hell, mind you, but to be brought into that fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. To be brought into the dance, to love and to truly know what it is to be loved. Like this is life, eternal life, satisfying life, meaningful life, resurrected life. This is why God made the universe. For you to know him and for him to give you life. Like what gospel, good news. And as we come to the end of this mission, I wonder where you are with God. Like we are praying that you may come to know this God who loves you so much. Please come to him and know salvation in him and know life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Oh, God wants you to have life, and so do we. Come to him tonight, please. Let's just pray. Father, we do thank you so much for the Lord Jesus and for how he has stepped into our place and how he has bore the wrath of God and how he has risen again so that if we trust you, Lord, that we can know fellowship and relationship with the living God come into meaning of life and to know you intimately Lord thank you for the such a good news that you give to us and just pray that many may come to know you tonight in Jesus name Amen again thank you so much for uh, tuning in each night and we really pray that the Lord will bless you thank you